The day I met Tom was ordinary until it wasn't. I was in the middle of my shift at the appliance store, my mind on selling dishwashers and fridges, when he walked in. He looked lost among the aisles of shiny new machines. Can I help you find something? I asked, stepping up with my best customer smile. Yeah, I need a good dishwasher for my folks. They've been nagging me about getting a new one, he replied, looking relieved to have some help. We walked over to the latest models, and I started into the details, the energy efficiency ratings, the capacity, different features. I could tell he was impressed. This one's pretty top-notch. It's got all the bells and whistles your parents could want, I explained, pointing out the sleek design. You sure know your stuff, he said with a chuckle. I wouldn't have guessed half of this stuff. Girls usually aren't into all these techie details, right? I just smiled, used to the comment. Well, I like to prove people wrong. We talked more about the specs, and eventually, he picked one out. Thanks for the help. I would have been here all night figuring this out. Glad I could help. Your parents are gonna love it, I said, ringing up the sale. That could have been the end of it, but as I was closing up shop, Tom was there again, leaning against his car, waiting. Hey. He said as I approached. I was thinking, maybe you could help me set it up. Just to make sure I get all the features working right. And maybe grab a coffee afterward? I hesitated, a bit taken aback. Sure, I guess. Just let me grab my things. Over coffee, Tom was easy to talk to. He had a lightness about him that made you want to open up. We talked about everything, work, movies, music. When he asked about my family, I kept it simple. Not much to tell, really. Raised by my grandma, now it's just me. She left me her house after she passed a couple of years back. Sorry to hear that, he said, his face softening. Must be tough, being on your own. It's alright. Keeps things simple. I shrugged, not wanting pity. What about you? You mentioned your family earlier. I prodded, changing the subject. Oh, the whole crew. My parents, two younger sisters, all crammed into one apartment. It's chaotic, but fun. He laughed. You'll meet them, I'm sure. They'd love to meet the girl who finally made me do my dishwasher duty. After that day at the cafe, things between Tom and me picked up speed like a whirlwind. We started meeting more, each date smoothly leading into the next. The connection was undeniable, we could talk for hours and still find things to laugh about. Before I knew it, love wasn't just a possibility, it was the real, palpable thing between us. A few months in, under a starlit sky in the local park where we had our fifth date, Tom dropped to one knee and asked me to marry him. The proposal was simple, no extravagant gestures, just him and me and a promise of a future together. I said yes, without hesitating. The day I was supposed to meet Tom's family, I was a bundle of nerves and excitement. This could be the start of having that big, loving family I always wanted. Tom picked me up around noon, and we drove over to his family's apartment. He knocked, and the door swung open almost immediately, pulled by a whirlwind of a woman who must have been his mom. Tommy. And you must be Carly. She exclaimed, pulling me into a hug that nearly knocked the breath out of me. Come in, come in. The apartment was buzzing with voices and the clatter of dishes. It was smaller than I expected for so many people, every inch filled with life and clutter. Carly, this is my dad, and those chaos agents are my sisters, Liz and Anna, Tom introduced, as each nodded or waved. Nice to meet you all, I said, my voice slightly shaky. We heard a lot about you. A girl expert in electronics, huh? Unusual his dad commented, sizing me up. I smiled, trying to take it in stride. Yeah, I've been into it since I was a kid. Keeps me on my toes. As we all settled into the cramped living room, Tom's mom brought out some snacks, and the interrogation began. So, Carly, Tom says you're all on your own now? Raised by your grandma? Liz asked, a bit too casually. Yeah, it was just us for the longest time. She passed a couple of years ago, so now it's just me, 
I replied, feeling a bit exposed. And this dress, is it vintage? Like from your grandma's closet? Anna chimed in, a smirk playing on her lips. I glanced down at my dress, a simple floral one that I thought was pretty retro but cute. Uh, no, it's from a thrift store downtown. They both laughed, and even Tom joined in a bit. That's our Anna, always quick with the jokes, he said, elbowing her lightly. Yeah, I can see that, I muttered, feeling the heat rise in my cheeks. The afternoon dragged on with more questions and a few more jabs that Tom's parents and sisters threw my way, all under the guise of good-natured teasing. By the time we left, my initial excitement had deflated completely. In the car, I was quiet, processing the afternoon. They liked you, I could tell, Tom said, trying to be reassuring as he drove. Did they? Felt more like I was on a talk show getting grilled, I replied, staring out the window. Ah, uh. that's just their way. They tease because they care. You'll get used to it, he said, reaching over to squeeze my hand. A few months after the awkward meeting with Tom's family, we got married. It was a modest wedding, mostly because I didn't have many relatives of my own to invite, and also because we wanted to keep things simple. The celebration was filled with Tom's relatives, who brought their loud and uncouth manners to the forefront. Throughout the day, they were boisterous, inserting themselves into every detail. They made jokes about my dress, saying it was too conservative for such a joyous occasion, and they didn't shy away from tossing crude jokes about our wedding night my way. I tried to brush it off, laugh along, but each comment chipped away at the joy I should have felt on my day. Tom noticed I was getting uncomfortable, squeezed my hand under the table, and whispered, Just a few hours, we'll get through this together. His words were meant to comfort, but the promise of a together was starting to feel heavier than I expected. It hadn't been long since we moved into my house, a place I cherished for its peace after a long day of work. But that peace was quickly shattered one afternoon when I came home to find lights blazing through the windows. Confused, since Tom was supposed to be at work, I pulled out my phone and dialed him. Hey, I'm outside the house, and the lights are on. Did you leave them on by accident? I asked, key in hand, hesitating at the door. No, I gave Liz my key. She wanted a quiet place to study? Tom's voice came through nonchalantly. I unlocked the door and pushed it open, my heart rate picking up. You what? Why didn't you ask me first? She's my sister, babe. It's not a big deal. Gotta go, talk later. He said before hanging up. Stepping inside, I found Liz sprawled on the couch, my laptop open in front of her. The room was a mess, snack wrappers everywhere, cushions ask you. I felt my pulse pounding in my temples. Liz, what are you doing with my laptop? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. She glanced up, unfazed, and shrugged. Just borrowing it. Chill, we're family now, right? That doesn't mean you can just take my things without asking. That's not how this works. I snapped, feeling the anger bubble up inside me. She rolled her eyes, closing the laptop with a snap. Geez, don't get all wound up. I always borrow stuff from my sis. What's yours is ours now, isn't that what family is about? I took a deep breath, trying to calm myself. No, Liz. I need you to ask first. You can't just come in here and take over. She scoffed, standing up and stretching. Whatever. Tom said it was cool, so maybe you two should sort that out. She brushed past me, her dismissal clear. I picked up my laptop, my hands shaking. That evening, when Tom came home, I was ready for a confrontation. Tom, we need to talk about your sister using our house like it's her own personal hangout. I started, the moment he walked in. He dropped his keys on the table and frowned. Carly, she's just a kid. She's not hurting anything. Why are you making a big deal out of this? She's not a kid, she's an adult, and she's disrespecting our space. Your family is overstepping, and you need to see that. I argued, feeling my frustration grow as he stood there, unmoved. Look, my family is just like that. They're open with each other. You're being too uptight about it. 
he countered, his voice raising slightly. Open doesn't mean entitled to invade my privacy or take my things without permission, Tom. That's not open, that's overbearing, and it's not okay. I shot back, my voice echoing in the now tense room. Tom sighed, rubbing his forehead. Okay, okay, I'll talk to her. Just, try to be a little more flexible. Yeah, for me? After he went to call Liz, I sat down, feeling defeated. The ease with which my sanctuary had been invaded left me uneasy. I had always valued my space and privacy, but now I wondered just how much of that I'd have to give up. I thought weekdays were tough, but weekends turned out to be the real trial. It started one Saturday when Tom casually mentioned that his parents wanted to drop by. I didn't think much of it then, figured it'd be a quick hello and goodbye. Boy, was I wrong. That morning, I was sipping coffee in the kitchen when the doorbell rang. Tom hadn't even gotten out of bed yet, and there they were, his parents, bursting through the door like it was their own. Morning, Carly. His mom greeted loudly, as if it was the middle of the day. We thought we'd come and spend the day. Hope that's all right? I was cornered, not really given a chance to say no. Um, sure, come in. I managed, stepping aside as they barged in with bags of who knows what. His dad didn't waste any time. Where's Tom? Still sleeping? That boy could sleep through a tornado. I just nodded, feeling my weekend relaxation slipping away. Soon, Tom stumbled in, rubbing his eyes. Oh, hey, mom, dad. What's up? Just thought we'd visit. We brought stuff for a barbecue. You got charcoal, right? His dad said, already heading to the backyard. The day blurred into a chaos of cooking, laughing, and more family members than I expected turning up. It wasn't long before Tom's sisters arrived, and the house filled up with noise and people. They took over the living room, the kitchen, every bit of space, while I was nudged here and there, my role reduced to that of a spectator in my own home. I tried to keep my cool, even managed to smile through it all. But when his mom started directing me around, that's when I felt the pinch. Carly, darling, could you whip up some of your salads? And maybe see if we need anything from the store? It was more a command than a request, and it stung. Sure, I'll check what we have, I said, forcing politeness. As the day wore on, the visit morphed into a full takeover. They sprawled out, watched my TV, changed the settings, ate my food, and left dishes everywhere. It felt more like an invasion than a family gathering. By evening, I was exhausted, physically and emotionally. I found Tom in the midst of it all, laughing and sharing stories. Pulling him aside, I hissed. Can we talk? What's up? He looked puzzled, clearly oblivious to my growing frustration. This can't happen every weekend. I said flatly. Your family takes over the house like it's theirs, and I feel pushed out. It's too much, Tom. He looked taken aback, then defensive. They're just enjoying themselves, Carly. It's what families do. You're overreacting. Overreacting? Tom, there's respecting family, and then there's this, disrespecting our space. Can't you see the difference? My voice was rising, tension tightening my throat. He didn't respond, just nodded slowly, looking more at the floor than at me. The rest of the evening I moved through the motions, cleaning up after his family, feeling more like a maid than a wife or even a guest at this wild family circus. They finally left late in the evening, leaving behind a mess and a silence that felt both heavy and relieving. As I looked around at the clutter and chaos, I wondered how many more weekends I could handle this, how many more invasions of my privacy I could endure before something had to give. Every day, the behavior of Tom's relatives grew more arrogant and defiant. They began to insult me openly, making snide remarks about everything from my cooking to my choice of clothes, and laughing off my frustrations as if I were the family joke. Tom, instead of defending me, often joined in, laughing along with their hurtful jabs. This constant disrespect and belittlement became too much to bear. After one particularly harsh comment from his sister that Tom laughed at, I couldn't hold back anymore. We had a blazing row that night, where I told him I felt more like an intruder in my own home than his wife. That was the last straw. 
Hurt and angry, I packed a small bag and moved into the spare room, locking the door behind me. I was jolted awake early Saturday morning by the sound of my bedroom door creaking open. Groggy and disoriented, I squinted through the dim light to see Tom's parents shuffling around my room, peeking into my closet, inspecting my furniture. After the quarrel with Tom, I'd been sleeping here alone, finding some solace in the little privacy I had left. What are you doing in here? I snapped, pulling the sheets tighter around me as I sat up. Oh, just checking out the room. Tom's mom chirped, not a hint of shame in her voice. This is the best room in the house, you know. His dad nodded, poking his head through my curtains. Yep, from today, we're thinking this will be ours. It's the most comfortable and beautiful in the house, after all. My mouth fell open. What? No, you can't just decide that. They both laughed, as if I told a good joke. Well, it's settled. We're moving in here. Gave our apartment to Liz? His mom added, as though it was the most natural thing in the world. I threw off my covers and marched straight to Tom, finding him in the kitchen, sipping coffee. Tom, we need to talk. Now. Your parents can't just take over my room. This has gone too far. Tom looked up, his expression unreadable. Carly, they need a place to stay. It's family. They think this room will suit them best. Suit them? It's my room, in my house. I protested, my voice rising. He shrugged, a casual dismissal that made my blood boil. Look, why don't you move your stuff to the attic? We can fix it up, make it nice for you. I stared at him, stunned. The attic? Really? That's what you think of me now? It's not like that, Carly. It's practical, is all. Tom said, his tone flat. His parents chimed in, agreeing. Yes, dear, be reasonable. We're family. And tomorrow, we're off to the city for your sister-in-law's wedding. You'll have the whole week to get the room ready for us. The whole room spun around me as they spoke. My home, my sanctuary, was being stripped away, piece by piece, by the very people who were supposed to respect it. As soon as the front door closed behind Tom and his parents, the silence of the house felt like a heavy blanket had settled over me. I was alone, finally, but the weight of what had transpired sat thick in my chest. They were gone for the week, and the thought of them returning to claim my room, the best part of my sanctuary, made my stomach churn. I paced the living room back and forth, my thoughts racing. This wasn't just about them taking over my space, it was about respect, and it was clear I wasn't getting any. Every corner of the house reminded me of the dismissals, the laughter at my expense, and Tom's complacency. Enough is enough. I muttered to myself. The decision crystallized in my mind with a clarity that surprised even me. I wasn't going to be pushed around in my own home anymore. First things first, I needed to secure my house. I called a locksmith, explaining the urgency. I need all the locks changed. Today, if possible. The locksmith was understanding and promised to be there within the hour. As I waited, I gathered Tom's and his parents' belongings. It felt surreal, packing up their things like I was erasing their presence from my life. But with each item I placed into the boxes, I felt a bit more of my resolve hardening. By the time the locksmith arrived, I had piled everything neatly by the door. I explained what I needed, and as he worked, changing lock after lock, I felt the first true wave of relief wash over me. Are you sure about this, ma'am? They won't be able to get back in? The locksmith asked, a final confirmation before he finished. I'm sure. Thank you. I replied, my voice steady. With the house secured, I stood outside, looking at the pile of their belongings. It was done. I'd taken the first real step towards reclaiming my life. But I knew this was just the beginning, there would be fallout. When they returned a week later, the confusion and anger on their faces as they found themselves locked out were exactly as I had anticipated. Tom was the first to react. Carly, what the hell is this? Why are our things outside? He shouted from the other side of the door, his knocks loud and persistent. This is my house, Tom. I told you, I'm done being disrespected. I shouted back, not opening the door. 
You can't just lock us out. This is my home too, Carly. His voice cracked with a mix of anger and desperation. It was my home before it was yours, and I'm taking it back. I suggest you take your things and leave before I call the police. I replied, stepping back from the door as his banging grew more frantic. There was a moment of silence, and I wondered if he'd left, but then he spoke again, his voice lower, almost pleading. Carly, please. Let's talk about this. We can sort things out. No, Tom. It's too late for talking. I've made my decision. Please, just go. The finality in my voice seemed to reach him, and the sounds from outside started to fade. They were taking their things. It was over. After a few days, my phone was bombarded with messages and calls from Tom. He was begging, saying anything to get me to let him back into the house. But it all just seemed like he was looking for convenience, not really about making amends. He missed the comfort, the space, not the respect and love that should have been the foundation of our marriage. One afternoon, while I was tidying up the remnants of what used to be our shared life, there was a loud knock at the door. I opened it to find Liz, Tom's younger sister, her face twisted in anger. You've ruined everything. She yelled the moment I cracked the door open. Because of you, we're all crammed back into that tiny apartment. I can't even have my boyfriend or friends over anymore. I stood there, door half open, feeling a mix of anger and pity. Liz, this isn't my problem. You need to leave. She tried to say more, her words sharp and accusing, but I wasn't having any of it. I pointed firmly towards the street. Go. Now. This is my home, and you have no right to come here and blame me for your issues. Liz huffed, mumbled something under her breath, and stormed off. I shut the door with a resounding thud, leaning against it as I let out a long sigh. It seemed like the chaos would never end. The real test came a few days later. I was walking home from the grocery store when I heard familiar voices calling out my name. It was Tom's parents, waiting for me at the end of the street. As soon as I was in earshot, they started hurling insults. You selfish, stupid girl. Look what you've done to our family. His mom shouted, her finger wagging in my face. You think you're better than us, keeping that house to yourself. His dad chimed in, his voice booming down the street. I stood there, groceries in hand. I did what I had to do for my own peace. You should leave now. I said calmly, though my heart was racing. That's right, you greedy. But before they could continue, my neighbor, Mr. Jacobs, who'd been trimming his hedge, stepped towards us. Hey. That's enough. I won't have this shouting in our street. Leave her alone, or I'm calling the police. Tom's parents glanced at Mr. Jacobs, then back at me, and without another word, they turned and hurried away. I muttered a thanks to Mr. Jacobs, who gave me a supportive nod before returning to his hedge. After the divorce was finalized, I put Tom and his family firmly in the past. I heard through friends that they were back in their cramped apartment, squabbling constantly among themselves. Life after Tom was quieter, simpler. I reclaimed my house and my life, painting walls, changing furniture, making everything mine again. One sunny Saturday, I decided to throw myself into gardening, a hobby I'd neglected for too long. As I was pulling weeds and planting flowers, my neighbor, Mr. Jacobs, leaned over the fence. Looks like you're making quite the change out here. He called out, a friendly twinkle in his eye. Yeah, I figured it was time to spruce things up a bit. Make it feel like new. I replied, wiping sweat from my brow. Need a hand? I've got some tools that might help. He offered. Actually, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. I smiled, grateful not just for the tools but for the company. As we worked side by side, Mr. Jacobs shared stories of his own life changes and challenges, making me feel less alone in my journey. You know, Carly, starting over isn't a sign of giving up, it's a sign of being strong enough to move forward, he said, patting down some soil around a new plant. I nodded, feeling the truth of his words settle in. I'm starting to see that. It's tough, but I guess it's worth it. After Mr. Jacobs left, I sat on my porch, sipping tea, and really looked at my garden, my home. 
It was transforming, and so was I. The sense of peace was new, hard won, and deeply cherished. That night, I made dinner for myself, a simple meal enjoyed at my kitchen table by the window. The house was quiet, but it was a good quiet, filled with potential and new dreams. I was on my own, yes, but I was truly myself again, stronger and surer than before. Life had thrown me curves, but here I was, ready to face whatever came next with a brave heart and a clear mind.